Basic, I'm the program manager for the Center for Pediatric Orthopedics at Gillette Children's. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning uh, to introduce Dr. Libby Weber. Uh, Dr. Weber joined us a year ago, September, uh, coming to us uh, from Connecticut Children's, and she's going to present this morning on pelvic trauma in pediatric populations. Dr. Weber. Thanks. This is a graphic talk. Oops. This is what children do, if you don't know that, if you don't have any, they do stupid things. And uh, these kids are catching some wild air over a big deserted road. And unfortunately, they picked a place where really no one travels except in ski season. Um, so I'm Libby Weber, thank you Jason for introducing me. There's a lot of unfamiliar faces in this audience, um, so I hope that I've this talk is at the appropriate level. This is about pediatric uh, pelvic fractures, which are very, very rare. Um, I'm asked, we can't get the disclosure statement to come up. Um, I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest to uh, reveal as they pertain to this talk. Um, I came from Connecticut Children's Medical Center, which is a level one trauma center, and I spent six years there. Um, over those six years, it's pretty rare to see real, you know, ring injuring um, pelvic trauma. So this is sort of a collection of cases from uh, my training in residency fellowships from affiliations I have with other hospitals. This is kind of a compilation, so you don't really see this very often. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna talk about the things to know about pelvic trauma in general, uh, how to work up a whole patient, uh, the important associations between the mechanism of injury and the type of trauma you would expect to see, and how pediatric pelvic trauma differs um, in children from adults. So, Pediatric pelvic fractures are very rare. They constitute less than 2% of all fractures in children, but they're serious because of those fractures, two to 5% of admissions to level one pediatric trauma centers are uh, pelvic trauma in children. High energy trauma is associated with other injuries, as you're well aware. Um, neurovascular structures, abdominal viscera, the general urinary system, CNS, and then also other musculoskeletal injuries. Um, the highest rate of mortality is with multiple injuries. It's between uh, 2 and 17%. Most of the common cause of death is concomitant CNS injury. And other causes are visceral injuries and multiple organ failure. Only 0.3% of the mortality is associated with vascular injury, and that's as compared to 10 times greater, 11 times greater, 3.4% in adults. So what does the pelvis do for us? What's, it, what's the purpose of the pelvis? We've all had this biology or medical school class and there's this big bone in the middle of your body, what's it going to do? Well, it transmits forces bottom to top um, and weight bearing from the lower extremities to the spine. <clears throat> it protects the organs that live inside it, the GI and GU systems, and it serves as a passage top to bottom for the vessels and nerves and muscles. Pelvic fractures are very high energy. Um, I mean, we'll talk distinctly about children's avulsion fractures and that's not what this is about, but um, in general, to break the pelvis is very high energy. So you have to be aware that other injuries are very likely to happen. You have to look for them. 75 to 95% of pelvic injuries in children result from a motor vehicle accident, whether it is they are pedestrian struck uh, or a passenger in the vehicle. 13% are falls and 4 to 11% are some sort of sporting event. So avulsion fractures, which are distinct to the pediatric population happen because children have these very robust tendons that attach to growth plates. Um, growth plates are apophyses, which are distinct from the physis in that the physis grows the bone longer and the apophysis is an area of a tendon attachment and as the bone grows bigger, the attachment point needs to get larger. It's made of cartilage because it's a growth plate and it's not anywhere near as strong as that robust tendon. So these kids pull the bone off uh, at the attachment point. So it's classically with an explosive eccentric contraction uh, the common areas are the anterior superior iliac spine and the anterior inferior iliac spine. Soccer players can pull those off, the sartorius and the rectus. The ischium, gymnastics, and I would add water skiing, the four splits mechanism. Um, and then the iliac crest, the tensor fascia lata can come off with track and long distance running. So, to start, uh, the examination, life-threatening injuries, um, and I'm preaching to the choir, I know. Um, should be assessed first. So for closed head injury, <clears throat> which is the leading cause of death, hemorrhage, which is rarely a cause of death in children but can be a concomitant problem, uh, chest trauma, abdominal trauma, and uh, genital urinary trauma. So the initial uh, trauma team evaluation, and this is long before I get there, uh, 
but obviously the ABC is airway, breathing, circulation, assessment of whether or not the circulation uh, in the patient is stable or unstable, and then disability. Okay, so say you've gone through those things, what's the next thing that happens here? Bueller? I will give you a hint, it involves trauma shears. So you gotta take all the clothes off these kids, you gotta look at everything. It's very, very tempting in a situation, especially if you're under assessing the gravity to assume that you know you don't need to look at every single part. This person has to be naked so you can look. Um, this is, you can see this car here and its grill pattern, which is nicely embedded on this child. Uh, this is a pedestrian struck. But you have to look for open injuries, and they can be anywhere in the body. You have to look for grill marks and tire marks. Um, these, so this is tires over the chest. These are both morgue pictures. <clears throat> Um, you want to inspect the entire body again. Flank ecchymosis, this is a Morala Valley lesion on the left. Crush uh, and degloving injuries and scrotal and labial swelling. And then the lap belt injury for kids that are involved in um, uh, passenger restrained injuries. So this is a, a seat, uh, shoulder belt and lap belt. Here's some uh, other more innocuous, but these, these kids uh, did not have chest restraints, just had lap belts and they have uh, serious concomitant abdominal injuries. <coughs> so you have to have a very high suspicion. These kids are kind of strung out over their, the, their midsection on the seatbelt. Okay, the orthopedic evaluation involves removing all the clothing, and you have to look at the crucial but often neglected areas, the perineum, the rectum, and the vagina. So this is a fall on a trailer hitch, and it was missed because the clothes weren't off when they came upstairs. Um, uh, we, we get patients upstairs for their isolated trauma, you know, femur injury, pelvic injury, or they're isolated orthopedic trauma, there's a uh, tampon in the vagina, there's no Foley catheter, this just means that all the clothes didn't come off and that the appropriate trauma workout didn't happen, so it's super important to take all the clothes off. Examination for pelvic trauma, AP compression, front to back compression, posterior pressure on the iliac crest is going to cause pain uh, when a fracture is present, lateral compression, lateral to medial pressure against the wings is also going to cause pain. But I would beg of you, in a teaching institution, it's really tempting to have every guy in line want to do this uh, examination. This is really painful in an awake patient, so really one exam. Gather all your friends around to see the reaction of the patient or whatever, but oh, please, just one examination. A complete neurovascular examination, vaginal and rectal exam. Uh, there's a 2 to 18% incidence of injury there. And then uh, fully catheter, please. Thank you. Uh, palpation, pa uh, palpate all the bony landmarks including the anterior superior iliac spine, iliac crest, pubic symphysis, and the SI joint and sacrum, so you'll have to log roll this patient because presumably we're still worried about spine trauma. Palpate all areas that you see any contusion, abrasion, laceration, or hematoma. So the standard imaging that you get in a trauma setting is an AP pelvis, and that's gonna reveal about 90% of all the fractures. So this is the iliopectineal line, and it's gonna demonstrate uh, whether the anterior column uh, is intact, and the ischial line in the back is gonna demonstrate whether the posterior column is intact. We can see the uh, inferior and superior um, pubic ramus fractures, and I think you can appreciate that there's a fracture in the back that is a, a shear injury. If you wanna further assess the pelvis because you don't understand the anatomy, and, it's in, and for whatever reason, this is not, uh, this is the next place to go for plain film imaging instead of, versus CT. So an inlet image is a 30 to 40 degree um, caudal projection. It gives you an axial of the pelvis. And uh, it's gonna demonstrate posterior displacement of the SI joints, as well as any sort of rotation of the hemipelvis. So you can see this displacement of the uh, iliac wing relative to the sacrum. And uh, this is the sort of area where you'll see injuries on that view. If you get an outlet view, which is a 30 to 40 degree cephalad projection, that's an AP of the sacrum, and that's gonna help you visualize the sacral foramina as well as vertical displacement of the hemipelvis. So here are the foramina, <clears throat> and you can see this vertical uh, displacement. So classification of pelvic injury. This is an adult classification, Young and Burgess. Uh, and this talks about the um, injury by force vector. So you can either have a lateral compression sort of hit from the side, an AP compression hit from the front or back, <clears throat> or a vertical shear, which is fall from a height. APC and LC types one, two, and three have increasing severity and there is a correlation with concomitant injuries. So this is just a, a cartoon to sort of demonstrate how that works. The top three, A, B, and C, are uh, lateral <coughs> compression injuries, um, uh, 
there's a compromise in the ring anteriorly for an A, B is anteriorly and posteriorly, and then in a C or the most severe type of injury for lateral compression, uh, there's a compromise on the contralateral side. D, E, and F are demonstrating AP compression injuries, so uh, a diastasis in the front of the ring. Um, the E is showing uh, compromise in the back of the ring, however, that's just the anterior ligaments and the posterior ligaments are presumed to be intact, and then a C or uh, a grossly unstable uh, ring fracture from AP compression involves the posterior structures as well. And then a vertical shear injury is shown um, transmitting the force from the femur up uh, to that hemipelvis with a vertical displacement. Okay, so these cats are demonstrating the mechanism of injury. <laughs> so lateral compression, these are associated injuries. Lateral compression injuries uh, um, involve in abdominal viscera. These are um, volume reducing injuries, right? You're squishing the pelvis, so those are abdominal visceral injuries that happen because of a squish. And also head injuries, you know, you're, if you're hit T-boned in a car, you're gonna hit your head. So this is the leading cause of death for lateral compression is head injury. Rare uh, pelvic vascular injury in this case. AP compression, however, that's a book opening injury or a volume increasing injury, and uh, that can squish the bladder. Urologic injury happens, as well as hemorrhage. Um, pelvic um, vascular injury is associated in 10% uh, of APC2 and 22% of APC3 fractures. So associated injuries are 58 to 87%. Neurolog neurologic injury is the first cause of death with a pelvic fracture. Um, and it happens in 26% of the population. Abdominal injury in 14% uh, and it's the second cause of death. Other bony injuries, uh, other musculoskeletal injuries happen in about half those kids. Um, hemorrhage requiring a transfusion in 21%. Thoracic injury, 7% uh, and GR injury in 4%. <clears throat> Associated injuries increase uh, with severity of pelvic injury and the highest is with multiple fractures of the brain. <coughs> Uh, concomitant genital urinary injuries. If you have a hematuria noted, um, oh, excuse me, it is noted in 14 to 52% of children with pelvic fractures. And, uh, but significant injury is only four to 15% with a bladder rupture or urethral injury. <clears throat> and you want to assess it formally if there's gross hematuria um, with a pelvic CT, retrograde urography or cystography, the urology console. Um, the patient is unstable hemodynamically. Uh, if the pelvis is the source, the blood loss is usually venous, it's 90% of the time. There's an intimate relationship between the anterior sacral ligaments and, ve and stretch injury and a venous injury. Um, a fracture it can often relate to uh, increased pelvic volume and a patient can exsanguinate into the retroperitoneal space. So this is just a reminder of how closely related the, the venous um, uh, system is with the uh, sacrum and the posterior structures of the pelvis. I would also comment that pediatric pelvis is very plastic, their ligamentous structures are very elastic, and their uh, venous and vascular structures are very elastic too, so that's what, uh, why they can have such high energy injury and then seem to not have the same uh, level of um, bleeding complications as the adult population. <coughs> okay, so this is a hemodynamically unstable patient with an open book pelvis. Anyone have any idea where the blood is here? your question. So the blood is here. It's in the retroperitoneal space. It's filling, it's elevating the bladder. It's filling up uh, this entire space. So as a first move, uh, we need to remember the formula for volume, okay? So there's only one modifiable variable in this formula, right? Four pi r cubed over three. Only thing you can do is reduce the radius. That's all, that's all you can do. So this is a big open book injury and closing that book down is gonna help you contain the amount of space that that blood can leak into. <clears throat> So you can do it with a pelvic clamp, with mass pants kind of out of favor, external fixator, a pelvic binder, or a sheet, whatever you have handy, but you want to make this um, space smaller. Anything that is going to reduce the volume until the source is found. <coughs> so here's an easy way to do that. The patient is on a sheet. Holder number one pulls the sheet. Holder number two pulls the sheet the other way, and then you just clip it. It's a couple seconds. It's, it's going to hold this pelvis together. <coughs> so here's the open book. Here's 15 seconds later with the sheet clamped on. It's a much smaller volume. Go back. Boom, boom. Right. Okay. If you want to put an X fix on a temporizing X fix, is very easy to place. Um, this is one technique. There are many, many techniques. But if you take a big spinal needle, this is um, Browner's technique <coughs> against the inner table, um, and then you can make an incision on the um, iliac crest. 
pre-drill about a third of the way out from the inner edge and then just using the trajectory of the spinal needle place a half pin. So it goes very quickly, put a half pin on the other side. <clears throat> uh, you construct a temporizing external fixator and then you can um, leave the clamps loose and roll the patient to the unaffected side. Uh, gravity will reduce this, the open book and uh, then tighten down the clamps. An X-fix is a nice thing to use if you need to get to other injuries, particularly in the abdominal area. Um, so this is a uh, patient had a big X-lap and uh, needed some sort of fixation, uh, was not stable enough to go to the OR and had an X-fix placed. Um, very easy to get to that incision. Everyone can see what they need to see. Uh, external fixation can be used as um, definitive care. This is a patient that had a SI joint displacement as well as uh, posterior uh, acetabulum and uh, open book with external fixation used instead of seal plating in the front. Very well tolerated, the X-fix. <clears throat> um, you got to consider how you're going to access all the other wounds. This is kind of following from the last one, but um, this kid has some uh, uh, femoral cut down, has uh, this big vac that needs to be attended to, and so an X-fix is a really good choice in this child so we have access to other things going on. So what if you have persistent hypotension despite fluid resuscitation <clears throat> and mechanical stabilization? Stabilization, sorry. Um, consider angiographic embolization. It is best for named vessels, so that's not most of them. It's not the case in 80% of blood trauma, and it's very, very, very rare in children. Um, this is just a picture demonstrating um, uh, the vascular tree and if you'll notice, uh, there's a huge uh, SI joint widening in the back on the left and a truncated internal iliac vessel. Uh, so the treatment is non-operative in almost all cases for children just because of their plasticity. Fractures that don't disrupt the integrity of the ring, APCs 1 and 2, excuse me, 1 and a, a lateral compression 1. Minimally displaced fractures, they can be partial uh, weight bearing on the side of the posterior injury. All avulsion fractures can be non-operative, um, or if, they, if they're wildly displaced, that's kind of an outpatient sports guy thing. Um, and this will constitute the vast majority of pediatric injuries. Operative fractures, um, they're just a variety of techniques, and I would defer to the adult orthopedist. These are adult <coughs> pattern injuries, and they're very likely the people who are gonna be taking care of these. But um, to close down the book in the front, symphysial plating can be used for anterior disruptions with greater than two centimeters of um, widening, percutaneous screw fixation for the sacroiliac joint. <clears throat> if there's a um, fecal or urinary contamination, likely then it's a much less desirable thing. Um, external fixation can be definitive management. This is a little patient that we had in Haiti who, um, that was her choice and um, she did great. Um, or, or anterior plating, like I said before, in combinations. Vertical displacement very often <coughs> needs to have skeletal or bucks traction to reduce the vertical <coughs> shear um, portion. And uh, traction can be definitive care, which is a really unfortunate long hospitalization. Very young patients, if uh, uh, once they get sticky, can be placed into a cast and cast may be required. So how does adult pelvic trauma um, differ from pediatric trauma? Um, it's more commonly low energy. Um, it's much less commonly operative. For the immature pelvis, meaning a wrist or zero pelvis, <clears throat> you need to focus on the associated injuries. Those are the problems. Um, because of the plasticity of the immature uh, pelvis, the non-operative treatment is indicated in almost all cases. I had a really, really, really hard time finding operative cases of pelvic fractures, and it took a scanning a big audience. Um, evulsion injuries do not happen in the adult population. I mean, well, they do, but not in the numbers that you see. And uh, so that constitutes a great deal of the uh, ICD-9 code 808, which is pelvic fracture, that like half of them are going to be um, avulsion injuries in children. And the, but there is potential injury to the growth plate, so you have to be a little bit careful about how they're treated. Okay, so this is the specific pelvic fracture classification for pediatrics. Uh, it's Turod and Z. Um, type 1 are avulsion fractures. Type 2 are iliac wing fractures, and they can be apophyseal or uh, a bony wing. <laughs> type 3 are simple ring fractures of the pubis and the acetabulum. And then the 4s are the ones that we would treat, and they're unstable segment types. So straddle injuries, which cause um, bilateral superior and inferior pubic ramus fractures. Anterior and posterior involvement in fractures which create an unstable segment between the acetabulum and the, uh, the rest of the pelvis. So this is just an example of um, avulsion injuries. Um, here I'm showing the ASIS, that's the sartorius pulling off. 
This is the AIIS, the rectus is pulling off, and here is a gymnast pulling her hamstrings off her issue. We <clears throat> see this a lot more commonly. Okay, these are just some interesting cases. Um, this was a five year, this case we got from uh, Yale. No. <laughs> I can't remember where I got this case. It's not <coughs> Five-year-old male involved in a motor vehicle accident. Um, he suffered a minimally displaced pubic root fracture. Can you guys see this right by the arrow sign? Just a little tiny fracture. Seems pretty innocuous. The treatment was non-operative partial weight bearing. He healed uneventfully. In follow-up two years later, however, he was shown by tomograms to have um, a physial bar on the triradiate cartilage. So um, apophyseal... Um, areas in the triradiate cartilage included is meant so that your ball and socket joint can grow concomitantly and the head can get bigger and the socket can get bigger and the unfortunate part about closing early in a seven-year-old uh, is that the socket is no longer going to get bigger and over time it should extrude this hip. Um, this group did do a physial bar resection which is not always a um, successful procedure and then they followed this kid out to 19 plus 5. He has, if you can appreciate on this x-ray, increased width of the quadrilateral plate just here he's extruding his femoral head he has a very large um, medial joint space <clears throat> and uh, these are signs that despite their great efforts and their understanding of the pelvis and real realization that the triradiate could be affected by this uh, fracture um, uh, he's he's gonna end up probably with a total hip i'm guessing um, so this is quite unbelievable. This is, is a patient of mine. This is a five-year-old who was a passenger in a minivan. He was appropriately seated in the back of the car behind mom. They were driving at highway speeds in back of a big truck that was carrying a load of rebar. You guys know what rebar is? Rebar. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, well, the rebar spilled out onto the highway and jumped up through the bottom of his mom's car and impaled him into his seat. Um, so they cut the seat out and uh, brought him to the hospital, and interestingly, he was fine. Nothing, got nothing, but fascinating, but disgusting case. <laughs> Another five-year-old, do you guys see the trend here? It's a risk factor to be five, evidently, at least in my sense. <laughs> Another five-year-old playing in her driveway, dad backed over her with a Chevy Tahoe. X-rays show a skeletally mature pelvis um, LC2 fracture. <clears throat> Lateral compression, right, she's squished, and you can see that she's affected in the front and the back, but not not that we can see on the contralateral side. Um, she underwent um, posterior fixation with a sacroiliac screw as well as a plate and then anterior fixation on her superior pubic ramus. Plate and screw fixation. Healed up. Did great. Okay, this is getting out of my patient population, but the 14-year-old intoxicated child joy riding in a stolen car. <clears throat> he crashed into a house, was brought to the ED as an activated trauma, and was found to be hemodynamically unstable, so taken to the OR for an X lap and pelvic, pelvic packing. On the way to the OR, they thought to call the ortho fellow about a pelvic fracture. Boom. <laughs> this is a medial dislocation of the hip, which is pretty rare. Um, uh, he underwent a midline X lap, pelvic packing, found to have a perforated large intestine. He had an IND and diverting colostomy. Hip reduction uh, was accomplished with a, a very, very exhaustive washout. Um, they had to excise the anterior wall to get the hip back in and an extended iliofemoral approach to deal with the wing which um, extended to the SI joint. SI screw fixation for the posterior uh, ring and then he went on to AVN of his iliac wing and contaminated his hip reduction with E. coli, believe it or not. Uh, here's another idiot, 17 year old riding intoxicated with five other kids. He, there wasn't enough room for him in the front so he was occupying the trunk. Uh, the driver lost control of the car and spun back into a utility pole. Uh, trauma imaging included chest x-ray, abdominal x-ray, and a limited pelvis, including what they were focused on was this uh, grossly deformed femur. So they appreciated this um, uh, acetabular fracture uh, and the femur fracture. However, um, he was unstable and they uh, delayed treatment. The night of arrival, um, they just temporized his femur and then they took subsequent abdominal films to assess uh, the evolution of his abdominal entry and uh, they noticed this huge vertical shear entry in the back of his pelvis which was missed night of completely. So he was placed in skeletal traction to reduce the shear and when stability permitted he underwent a stage retrograde femoral nailing, percutaneous SI joint stabilization and anterior ring plating. So here's his SI joint, anterior ring plate, his nail. Okay so what's this pattern and what would we expect for associated injuries? This gets back to the compression. 
Which one? Is it squishing or opening? Lateral. It's a squish, right? So this is a lateral compression injury. What are you? What What would you expect if this child? If I told you this child died, um, what would you expect? Is the most likely concomitant injury? Internal iliac. Yeah, head. Whoops! I didn't even write down the answer. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah, um, that will be um, abdominal uh, viscera as well as a uh, head injury is going to be the most likely cause of um, death in that child. What's this pattern and what should you expect for associated injuries? Sure. So he has a diastasis in the um, anterior ring and it's kind of difficult to appreciate that he does have some winding in both these, um, uh, SI joints posteriorly, but this is an open book pelvis. Why does he have a chest tube laying across his pelvis? I'm not sure. Maybe they're getting ready to put chest tube in. I'm not sure. Um, so you would expect um, bladder entry potentially with this and potential vascular entry. Okay, so the outcome for children is strongly influenced by the concomitant injury. So the whole talk is about it never happens, and if it does happen, you shouldn't be worried about the pelvis as much as you should be worried about other things that are happening as well. Other bony injuries will predict head or abdominal injury, transfusion requirements in the first 24 hours, and just, you know, if you have any access to people in the community that would be thinking they could handle this outside of a level one trauma center, discourage that thought process because this is not something that you can treat um, in the community. Pelvic fractures requiring surgery in kids are very, very rare because of the plasticity of their bones, the elasticity of their tendons, as well as the pubis and SI joints, and the lower energy mechanisms in general. Life-threatening vascular injuries associated with fractures are rare. Yeah, there's just much more compliant vascular churn. It's over 10 times more rare in children. So expect morbidity to be related to concomitant injury. Sorry, I'm a fast talker. Any questions for me? I only put like three people to sleep. Yeah. It's probably opening it up a little bit, but uh, we're a family of a, a few hospitals that's gonna expand. In your experience, maybe globally pediatric, or though any common themes of transferring physicians of either too early, too late, not enough. Uh, that so should, the hospital I worked at was physically attached, and similar to this situation, to um, Harvard Hospital, level one trauma center, helicopter pad, and um, to my knowledge, they were all coming to us. There was really no other one. Yale has level one trauma, but they didn't have level one pediatric trauma, so I think they were all coming to us. Um, I, I did my training at Dartmouth, and we had a lot of kids that were being transferred inappropriately to outside hospitals because they you know ski injuries and whatever, and they were in very outlying areas, and instead of being on the helicopter, they were taken by ambulance to an outlying hospital. And yeah, um, that's a great point. If these kids, if the EMT is picking them up or the people in the in the field aren't understanding the severity of these injuries and transferring them to a non-level one trauma center, it's a really big problem because these kids, if they have concomitant injuries that are um, life-threatening, they need to be at a level one trauma center as soon as possible. Great point. Yes, sir. Right, so uh, two questions, and we'll, we'll go to the complete opposite end of things. Okay. Um, Post-operatively, therapist mobilizing this patient, mm -hmm. typically partial weight bearing on the involved side? Yes. Okay. Um, how much do we worry about um, repeated hopping on the non-involved side? I mean, how, how especially, especially if we're not internally fixed or anything like that. So, we have, so, we have, so basically we have a kid hopping on the good side. In general, I find kids to be pretty self-protective. If they're uncomfortable, they're not gonna hop. And when they do hop, although it scares you to death, they probably have enough um, stickiness that they're not gonna disrupt mm -hmm. anything. Vertical shear is what I would worry about a little mm -hmm. bit more than anything else. Right. And um, if the surgeon feels that they're stable enough not to have internal fixation, then my guess would be that they're stable enough to be doing what they're gonna do. Okay. And then and then second question, this, this fun little uh, avulsion uh, injuries yeah. in the gymnasts. Yes. They always wanna go right back to gymnastics. No, that's a six-month injury. Okay. They shouldn't go back to gymnastics. Right. Take me to Regents. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.